On this episode of Industry Relations, we talk to one of the OGs of online real estate, Spencer Raskoff. Let's go. This is Industry Relations, a podcast that's at the intersection of real estate and technology from an insider's perspective with Rob Hahn and Greg Robertson. Hey, everybody. I'm so excited to announce our inaugural sponsor of the Industry Relations podcast, Note Router. Um, Note Router was launched back in 2018 by Nick Goff, and they had the mission of reconnecting real estate. Um, Note Router is an all-in-one email and texting platform designed exclusively for real estate. Uh, Note Router syncs with your membership database to make communicating with your members easier and more effective. Believe me, your staff is going to love you for this. If you're an association or MLS and you want to do a better job with communicating with members, really look no further. Um, they've just launched a brand new website. It looks fantastic, by the way. I'll put the URL in the show notes. It's noterouter.com. Go there, take a look. You'll find everything you need. Once again, thank you, Nick. Thank you uh, to everybody at Note Router for sponsoring the Industry Relations Podcast. Rob and I truly appreciate your, your support. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of Industry Relations with Rob and Greg. This is obviously Rob. Uh, your co-host, the notorious ROB, and with me, as always, is the fabulous Greg Robertson, wearing the fabulous fans hat. That's right, with the <laughs> fabulous jazz hands. And anyone just listening uh, on the podcast, like, is, has no idea what the hell we're talking about. How the hell are you, Greg? Hello, Rob. How are you, man? I'm doing all right. You know, all things considered, we are back in conference travel season. That's so right. I've been on the road a bit. Um, but uh, th at least I'm not going to Indianapolis next week. You know, but I, it's the entire week, man. Oh, I'll, I'll be out be... there. I leave Wednesday, so looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Sunny's uh, gone the whole week because she's helping out the conference. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. She will have to represent the Han clan, I think, <laughs> as she will so ably do. <laughs> but, uh, hey, man, you know, we, we've got a very special guest today. Uh, oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. I can't it's wait to have this conversation. <laughs> so that, it, 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 without me. I know it's I, we, we're like we're like a we're like a real podcast now. Yeah, no, jeez. Uh, <laughs> so without further, let's just bring him on, Spencer Raskoff, the co-founder of what? Zillow, whoop whoop, um, and the co-founder and chair of Picasso. Uh, so two companies, one that has definitely revolutionized real estate, and one that is quite likely to revolutionize real estate. Uh, and I know you have your hands in a bunch of other things as well. So, yeah. Welcome. Thanks, guys. I'm super. I'm excited to be here, uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you for having me. Lots to uh, talk about. I had so much to talk about, but uh, I know time is not. We don't have all the time in the world. You know, wish with this were like a Joe Rogan thing would just go for four hours, but it isn't. <laughs> God, no, please no. Please. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first, I mean, I, I just want to say I, I'm sorry I missed your session at Blueprint, uh, the conference that was here in Vegas. Uh, so maybe I'll just ask you, and maybe you could have. Give like a 30 second, like what, what did you sure. talk about a blueprint? That's a different I, audience. So yeah, I, so the, blue, the blueprint audience is a lot of founders and also VCs and prop tech investors. I think I was kind of a downer, um, to be honest. I think I, <laughs> um, I, I, I poured a lot of cold water on, on everything. Um, you know, we, Clelly and I were talking, uh, uh, you know, she, she interviewed me and she runs a venture fund. We're talking about the state of venture capital and prop tech. And I was pretty negative saying that the public comps are way down. If you look at the publicly traded companies in our space, they're way down and VCs have noticed. And so it's very difficult to get a private round done for a prop tech startup right now. And mm. that's what we mostly talked about. Unfortunately, it wasn't, wasn't that uplifting a conversation to be honest. All right. Well, so that's, we might as well start there because uh, <laughs> yeah, the public comps are way down and it's hard to explain in a way. And I, you know, I'm in a bunch of email threads and text chains and I'm sure Greg, you are as well. And Spencer, I know you are like yeah. people talking about like compass, you know, going below, I think they're below a billion in market cap, uh, talking about open door, talking about, you know, all of the high flyers, I guess everyone basically other than EXP is that I think that's a pretty fair uh, EXP is way down. Also Zillow yeah. Zillow's at like a seven year low or something. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. Everyone is just, has just been so crushed. what's your take on it? I mean, is this just the market overreacting to things just saying housing uh, sucks or what, what do you think is going it, on? Well, I mean, it's the market saying housing sucks, right? So mortgage rates have gone from 3% to six and a half percent. I'd say prop tech is, is in this double whammy where, 
as interest rates went up, overall growth investors kind of fled and moved more into slower growing profitable companies or, or, um, or financial services in some cases or, or energy kind of, there was this tech sell off that we've seen. And then the, the, the second shoe to drop was the housing sell off that we've seen. So prop tech companies like a Zillow or a compass or any of these other companies, uh, you know, they've, they've got these two, these two issues that they're fighting through. Unfortunately, I, I think the market's not really differentiating between the companies that are going to survive through this mm -hmm. housing and tech downturn and, and perhaps even flourish through it versus the other ones that are not. I mean, it's kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater type situation that we're seeing right now. Which yeah. is, you know, I know you're, you're kind of investors in some like, uh, you know, offer pad, you know, some iBuyer buyer space and obviously yeah. Zillow. You know, what, what was, I just read Brad Emin posted a piece and I hadn't thought of this, but these power buyers seem to be in a pickle here. I mean, the, the, the value proposition there from what I understand a lot of times is, well, get a, you know, you want to be able to compete with all these cash offers. So, yeah. you know, why don't you partner with a, with a, with a power buyer um, so that you can do that? But I don't know if there's a lot of competition with cash buyers right now. No, um, you're, you're exactly that model, right. Greg. That yeah, model to me says very, it's in a lot of peril. I mean, a lot of danger right now. You well, think? so I'm an investor in a couple of those companies, a couple of power <laughs> buyers. I'm an investor in ribbon and fly homes. And they, uh, you're, you're absolutely right that the value proposition of a power buyer is diminished because the value prop was, will turn you into a cash buyer to compete. And that's obviously in a slowing market in a, in a, a buyer's market that's less valuable. Um, several of them uh, have already it had already even before we hit this this uh, turbulence the last couple of months they had already expanded their value prop to be more full scale brokerage. Right. So, like in the case of Fly Homes, for example, the will turn you into cash into a cash buyer that was had become only a small part of the value prop. They had really expanded far beyond power buying into, you know, use us for your whole buying and selling experience, more of like an end to end brokerage and, and the power buying aspect of it had just become a feature. And so I think companies like that are, are quite a bit more protected. Um, but every brokerage, every, you know, everybody in the real estate ecosystem, whether you're selling leads to real estate agents like Zillow or your, um, selling franchises like uh rematch like, yeah yeah or uh, you know or you're um earning a commission in the transaction like a redfin or a um fly homes i mean they're all gonna have a pretty hard next year or two because let's face it sides are gonna be down commissions are gonna be down i mean it's just gonna be a a, a Nothing like 2008. So that's the silver line. This is why, you know, I said, I think I kind of depressed the blue. I should probably, probably stop doing interviews for six or seven months. <laughs> I'm just going to make everyone sad. Listen, but, you're on the uh, last podcast here because we got Rob on, man. So I uh, seriously, like I, I was recently introduced as the only demotivational speaker in real estate. So <laughs> I like that. I've never heard that before. I like that. <laughs> No, but, uh, I mean, you know, there is a silver lining. I have to, if you know, if you if you if you want me to offer that to, to listeners before everybody changes the channel or or you know, <laughs> um, uh, you know, the silver lining is great companies can get built through these downturns, and yeah. we saw this in two thousand eight, right? I mean, Zillow and Trulia and Redfin are three companies that not only survived the two thousand eight downturn, but they flourished through it. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple really clear reasons for that. Number one. It becomes less competitive. So you know, if you for, for every uh, for every challenging uh, experience one company is going through, all the others are as well. And so, uh, in the case of Zillow, for example, in the 2008 to 2012 time period, there was almost no venture capital put into prop tech, mm -hmm. uh, into B 2 C prop tech real estate portals. And so, Zillow and Truly really benefited from that. But the other reason why great companies can get built during these downturns is all the cards get thrown up in the air. And when that happens, people's habits change, their uh, company's habits change, and new winners get built and get created through these challenging times because everybody's decision tree looks different in, in difficult times. And so that's why you know, th there is definitely a silver lining as we've seen through other cycles where, where great companies get built. So all Yeah, I, I, I started my uh, last company, WNR Studios, in 2008, you know, Dan Woolley and I co-founded that. And, you know, we had, <laughs> there was an architect's office that was like going under and they had some cubicles we were renting from them that they, they appreciated the money. 
because nobody was building or anything anyway. Right. <laughs> and we right. just grew as it kind of went, you know, grew as it went back up. So I think uh, that, that's a lot of a lot of great companies. I think start in that type of downturn. So I hope. Uh, so let's let's actually let's chat about this. I know. Greg and I have talked about this in the macro side a little bit, and I've been giving presentations, talk about macro. And the one thing that's just really bizarre, and I know I have my theory, but I'd love to get your take on it, um, especially as you guys talk about the power buyer model and how they're under pressure. What's weird about this, this market is, okay, sides are down, buyer demand is clearly down, but prices are still way up. Yeah, because I mean, the last read, so right? The inventory still, right? Yeah, right. So the last read was something like fourteen percent year over year, and yeah. to your, like new listings are way down, right? Maybe not way down; they're down like six percent, right? So it's this weird thing. Okay, buyer demand is down, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, and in certain markets, I mean, we're still seeing homes close. You know, forty eight hours, like seventy two hours with multiple offers. We're still seeing that, right? right. Investor activity does not appear, at least, to have completely dropped off the planet. Maybe they're not offering as much as they were before. Mm -hmm. But was it Atlanta? I think market is like 30 percent, one out of three homes or something like that, are bought by investors. Because in this inflationary environment, a lot of folks are like, you know, I'm going to park my money in real estate, yeah. right? It, it's it's a solid, it's a real asset, and it generates cash flow. So I guess what I'm curious about, is, again, especially because of investments. Is there data, you know, out there that start to show that, you know, the investor appetite is gone, they're no longer in the game, so therefore the value proposition is lower? Like, what, what are, is, is there anything more than what we're seeing kind of at a high level? And I think you uh, have, uh, uh, was it Arrived? Which I thought was yeah, great. I mean, I'm, I'm, so I've got a couple investments that kind of relate to this. So, so Arrived Homes lets people buy into single-family rental real estate for as little as a couple hundred bucks, um, you know, it lets people get exposure to right. winning single family real estate. They're growing very quickly. They have right. great product market fit. There are a lot of people, especially people who are maybe disillusioned with crypto or disillusioned with the stock market, but want to invest. And, you know, it's a lot of work and, and it's a big price, a big uh, entry price to go buy a rental property yourself and manage it. And so instead mm -hmm. people are using companies like arrived and there are a couple other competitors in the space as well. Um, uh, in, in, in commercial and in, in yeah. multifamily, there's, you know, realty mogul and, and, um, uh, Roofstock and a bunch of others. Yeah. But anyway, um, so, so I haven't seen a reduction in consumer interest on the investor side for that at all. I mean, that's right. continuing to crank. Um, and um, and that's good news. Uh, you know what what is characterizing this market is mortgage rate lock in, which I think people probably don't focus on enough. Which is to say, you know anybody that has a two, three, four percent mortgage, yeah. it's very hard for them to list their house right now and oh, yeah. buy a new house, right? Yeah, at six percent. So that's going to further constrain inventory because those are people that are not going to be sellers, and we already know inventory is constrained. So what? What few deals that get done or what few listings occur, I think they're going to continue to sell you know, pretty quickly at, at relatively good prices. I don't think you're going to see home values crater. You are going to see transaction volume crater. I mean, you're but in that context, Spencer, wouldn't, I mean, again, the narrative <clears throat> is power buyers. So take a fly homes, take a yeah. ribbon, take one of these guys, or even an eye buyer, take open door, right? The idea is, okay, <clears throat> they're in real trouble because mortgage rates are high. I'm like, wait a minute. Unless I'm totally mistaken, the premise band power buyer is first you qualify for a mortgage yeah. right, with us, and then we lay out the cash, right? And so, and if the investor activity is still out there, like you still have to compete with them, at least at the lower end, right? And we're talking luxury, high end, million dollar plus house. We're talking the three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars starter homes. You're still That's competing with investors, right? Am I? Like, what, what's yeah, your thoughts? No, you, you, you're, you're right. I mean, that, uh, put it this way in 2000. Five to well, this is the first housing recession that we've seen where there is a very robust ecosystem of investor buyers mm -hmm. as we enter it. I mean, this, right. this, I mean, Invitation Homes, obviously, and 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 Starwood Waypoint and Colony America Homes, they were around clearly, uh, you know, in prior recessions, but but they mostly grew. Most of those companies started after two thousand eight. That's right. In, That's in the right. wake of that housing downturn, so so it'll be very like like hopefully there's some investor price support and some investor de you know, demand support on the transaction volume side. 
because those companies didn't exist in prior downturns. That's right. I know on the I buying side, I think obituaries of I buying as we enter a slowing housing market are wildly premature. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact is that the value prop that an offer pad or an open door provides to a seller is greater in this market than in a yep. super hot market. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when, yep. you know, the biggest issue, the biggest business challenge that iBuyers face is sellers turning down the offer that the iBuyer makes. And so the certainty th that, um, you know, that a seller receives now from an iBuyer is, is, is greater. What the iBuyers just have to do is make sure they're charging a large enough fee. This is right. Dillo got wrong, um, charging a large enough fee to provide enough revenue for to cover the selling expenses and and debt service and the, the refurbishment cost uh, to actually do it profitably. But uh, I buy and can do quite well through a housing downturn. In fact, it, it should do better in theory than in a hot market for the yeah. reason I just described. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I mean to me, you know, this is, brings two questions to me. I mean, you, you're a, a big, you know, an investor in OfferPad, right? And, you know, that brings up kind of two questions. And I know OfferPad, I think, you know, has been profitable, um, unlike some other thing, some, some other company, iBuyers. Um, yet, it also brings to me, like, when I remember when, when I read about that, you know, <laughs> what is the relationship that you have now with Zillow? Because it seems like, you know, you have OfferPad, you're, you're, you're investing in companies that, um, it, you know, back when Zillow was doing that kind of stuff was yep. directly competing. Um, you know, you, you, I think you were starting a fund with former Zillow people, um, you know, and, and that were still passionate about real estate. But I think there's a lot in the industry that are a little bit curious about, sure. as much as you can say, um, you know, what is your what is your relationship with with Zillow? I mean, sure. So I'm I'm still a large shareholder of Zillow. Uh, you know, we're having this conversation in fall of 2022. I'm still a large shareholder, but I haven't been involved in the company. I haven't been on the board for more than two years. I think maybe even three years. And um, so I still have a lot of friends there and root for the company as a shareholder. And, you know, it'll always be a, an important part of, of, of me and my life, but I'm not, you know, not directly involved in the company at all anymore. Um, uh, I now focus my time at 75 and Sunny Ventures, which is my family office, investing mm -hmm. in other companies. And so I've got investments in about 100 startups, about 25 of them are in prop tech. And, um, and so within prop tech, I'm an investor in Fly Homes, Ribbon, La House, Properly, Nomad, Doma, Tomo, um, gosh, um, uh, uh, Avenue 8, Radius Agent, um, Luxury Presence, and probably a dozen more. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So I'm an investor in a lot of prop tech companies. And then my SPAC took OfferPad public. So I'm a large shareholder of OfferPad, but I'm not on the board there. Um, and then I spend most of my time, probably at least around half my time, on Picasso which is a company that I started with former Zillow folks, including Austin Allison, who's our amazing CEO. And so uh, anyway, so Greg, that's, that's my. And, that's, and that's your time there, I'm, when you left Zillow, it was just, was it a matter of, I'm, I'm just done with this. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you were done with real estate because everything else you did, it was just. Yeah. Was I mean, I left, I left I mean, Zillow about three years ago because I had sort of, accomplished what I wanted to accomplish there. The company was already big and successful. It had become about three or 4,000 employees. It had a 10 or $20 billion market cap. And, um, and uh, importantly, I, I, I felt that I had led the company into iBuying successfully. And when I, you know, most, a lot of people don't remember this or kind of think like, oh, the iBuying thing that happened after Spencer left. Well, it, it didn't actually. I mean, mm -hmm. I led Zillow into iBuying. Yeah. I turned over the shareholder base. I, I convinced Wall Street that it was the right move. I convinced the employees and I, um, and I figured out how to do it with the industry. Since this is an industry relations podcast, I figured out how to do it uh, by bringing the industry along and paying commissions and keeping premier agents in the transaction and, and sort of balancing the two. And, and it's kind of come in full circle, right? Where you started with a marketplace it went to them doing it directly. Yeah. And now it's back to kind of a singular yeah. marketplace. Yes, open, right? it, 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 exactly. Greg. And so, so, I mean, when, when I was running Zillow, I buy and we got up to about 20 markets and we were charging about a 10% fee to sellers and we, and it was working. We were able to do the business profitable at a contribution margin level or, or nearly profitable and um you know and and it was scaling and 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 uh and effective and i think you know what eventually happened was zillow reduced the fee from about 10 percent to i don't know one or two percent 
And according to what I've read, again, I wasn't involved in the company anymore, but I guess that fee was not enough to cover the interest expense and the selling costs. And so then uh, Zillow got out over their skis and the acceptance rate of their offers went way up, you know, which makes sense. If you reduce the, uh, the fee that you're charging a seller from 10% to 1%, people are going to accept the offer quite a bit more often. And so Zillow bought more homes than they expected and then decided to leave the space. So all that happened after I left and, um, uh, you know, it's unfortunate and it's been so hard to watch as a shareholder, obviously, as, as yeah, the company yeah. is trying to reboot now. Hey, everybody, I'm so happy to announce that we have a new sponsor for industry relations, and that's Earnest. Earnest is a secure, convenient digital payment system that allows for a fully digital transfer of funds in real estate transactions. So thank you, Russ, and please visit Earnest.com. That's E A R N N E S T.com. Thanks again. So I have to, since I have the opportunity to actually ask you this, you're exactly right. I think you're, one of your earnings calls was the most influential thing for me, you know, when I was like, just trying to think through iBuying. I don't know if you remember this, but you, I want to say it was maybe, God, Q3 of like 18, maybe, you know, um, and what you pointed out was, look, Zillow has this essentially like a mailing list. Like you have millions of consumers coming in and say, I'm looking for this type of house. Alert me when one of these appear, right? And I remember you saying to them, look, we know, we have thousands and thousands of people. So when we buy a house, like before we buy, we can go to these people and say, hey, if we bought this house, we'd be interested. And I remember what I, one of the things I speculated was, why couldn't Zillow or I buying generally literally just become a straight market maker with no work? Like, yeah. hey, we're going to buy this house, right? It's a piece of crap. It's a, you know, a handyman move in, but we'll sell it to you for $3,000 more than we bought it for, right? Like, why did that never happen in iBuying? What do you, what do you well, think? Yeah, I mean, and, and maybe it evolves to, to there eventually. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the value prop that it was providing to sellers was speed and certainty. Right. And, um, you know, I just I don't know if there's enough margin without the refurbishment that was necessary, right? So, so what we were doing, we charge you know, take a four hundred thousand dollar home, right? Say to the seller, it's a ten percent fee, so the seller nets three hundred sixty thousand, right? And then put about twenty thousand into the home, and you're able to resell it for you know for enough to to make money, and you're driving mortgage attached revenue, right? Is right. the extra gravy and cherry right. on top? I think what you're describing. Maybe it, it could work, um, but without the, um, you know, without the value no trade from the establishment, it's, it's. I well, what I guess wondering was, is you go to the seller and say, listen, it's a, and nowadays it seems to be about 5%, right? So it's $400,000 home. We'll buy it from you for whatever. Uh, so what's that? Uh, 20,000? 380, right? Yeah. And then you go to like the list of buyers who said, alert me if one of these appear. They go, yeah. hey, before we refurbish, yeah. <laughs> Do you want this? We'll, we'll sell it to you for well, three. I, I talked to someone yesterday who's doing that pretty effectively in, in a single city at, um, okay. you know, he, so he's, he's, his company sends direct mail to sellers and um, does door knocking to sellers and is yeah. able to generate seller interest. Yeah. He puts the, he puts a home under escrow. He then lists it in the MLS, finds a buyer and, you know, he's earning a, right. a big, so three, right. Yeah. So he's basically doing that um, pretty effectively, uh, you know, in one city. Um, you know, maybe it could work. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's I certainly like that it's asset light. Um, I'm just a, I'm a little skeptical that it, it's it's like a pure financial arb arbitrage that I just I kind of wonder it, how much how much margin exists in it, and if right. if it's working, whether other local flippers basically close that arbitrage right. gap. Um, what, you know, from what I learned from my offer pad experience is that, um, if you can do, you know, offer pad spends about a thousand dollars a day doing its renovation. It takes about two ish weeks. So they put in like 15,000, you know, 14, 15,000 ish dollars in two weeks. Mm -hmm. If you do that smart and quickly and with employees, which offer pad uses as compared yeah. with Zillow or open door, typically outsourced to subs, um, that 15,000 can be worth twenty five or thirty thousand out the other end when you resell it because mm -hmm. you're upgrading the appliances, you're changing the countertops, you're laying new carpet, and you're painting it, and you know maybe yeah. replacing the lawn, 
And, and so there's, there's quite a bit more margin available if you do that well. Now, some companies don't do it so well, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, but uh, anyway. Yeah, no, I was just really curious. Like I said, when you, when you said that on the earnings call, it's like this yeah. light bulb went off for me. It's like, okay, this is not flipping. This is not, you know, we buy ugly houses. This is, and I really thought this, this is pure financial arbitrage. This is market making, yeah. right? And it's yeah. like, you make that little whatever half point, you know, nickel per mm-hmm. trade, but it's it's just happening. Fast. And I was just I always wondered why we didn't see that coming out of Zillow specific because you guys had that base of buyer interest where you knew, you know, yeah. So and maybe that's where Zillow point. decides to take it now that they're now that they're out of the actual live buying space. I mean, obviously, yeah. they had this partnership with Open Door, yeah, um, and um, that's a handoff. Yeah, you know, the seller yeah. sees this estimate. And it is told, hey, if you want to yeah. sell your house, open door, you know, click over here. Um, and, you know, maybe they integrate it a little bit more deeply, like you're describing, where they're also trying to. Arbitrage. So let me pivot a little bit here, because, look, I mean, Spencer, let's face it, you are one of the, the big leaders kind of of our industry. You know, the, the new generation after the Gary Kellers and the, you know, Dave Linegers of the 70s. Right. I think the next generation is like people like you and Greg and, you know, Rich Barton and some of these guys, Eric Wu. Um, I have this notion and I've saw, I've seen a number of videos and listened to a number of podcasts in the recent years that talk about, let me see if I could articulate this correctly. We have lots of problems in our society. And the theory is almost all of those problems, the root cause is housing, specifically housing on affordability right now. I also know you're very, very involved in, and you're very sort of um, solicitous, if you will, of your home city of Los Angeles, which certainly has problems. And I think you can argue that housing is the root cause of a lot of those problems. What's your take on number one, that idea? And number two, how do we solve housing? <laughs> like, what are your yeah. thoughts in terms yeah, of that? That's all you're asking how, how to solve housing, Rob. Yeah, well, I, I mean, this. if I anyone this. knows, Spencer knows, <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, look, look, Rob, you're, you're totally right that, that, um, uh, this is like the, the, you know, probably up there with gun control. This is probably the issue of our time because it relates to everything from, from affordability to, um, to homelessness, to, to crime, to, you know, you name it. A lot of it is tied up in housing. The issue is we don't have enough houses. There's, you know, and what happened was to be very specific after 2008, Home builders kind of sat on their hands for a couple of years. We went from having about a million homes a year built to 300,000 homes a year built. So we had a couple of years there where we were missing like 700,000 homes. And you roll that tape forward and we're missing, I don't know, three to five million homes in the housing stock. And that's the root of the problem. And the way to fix it is uh, you need more pro-development policies in a lot of these cities. And so... Um, you know, we don't have time to explore all this, and I'm certainly not the leading expert on this, but uh, there are just a lot of city, states, communities where some combination of NIMBY local residents and and just local politics make it very hard to do development, very hard to build new homes and new multifamily properties. And that's the problem. That's what we need. That's, you know, I mean, Zillow put out some great data. I'm sure you can find it on Google around um housing supplies impact on rental rates impact on homelessness and i you know i, I forget the exact data if it was from a couple of years ago but it was something like for every you know hundred dollar a month increase or maybe it was less than that it's probably for every like fifty dollar a month increase in rent this city will have this many more homeless people this city yeah. will have this many more homeless people and there you can draw a, a straight line between housing affordability and homelessness um it's, uh, you know, yes, there, there are many causes of homelessness from drug addiction to, to transportation issues to, uh, I mean, spouse and child abuse. But at the end of the day, it's affordability is the biggest cause of homelessness. So we need more homes is the short answer. And we need home builders to do their part. Although, think, frankly, I think home builders would build uh, if the economics were there. The problem really is, is mostly a political issue around so um, <clears throat> so that's kind of what i'm wondering like it's okay so you think about every aspect of the industry yeah, right, of real estate plus finance right 
because finance guys, it's like they would, I'm sure they would love to see more houses. They could make more mortgages. They could do the construction loans plus home builder. And it's like, you have, you have entities, organizations that frankly like hate each other and distrust each other, you know, NAR, Zillow, CoStar. But I feel like on this issue, there's complete unanimity. You know, everyone agrees right. we need better housing. Why, why well, aren't we seeing that? I it, guess it's the question. So fragmented and local. I mean, if, if, if it were a federal issue, I think you're probably right. We probably would have seen some solution because all those giants would bring their, their, uh, their lobbyists and their budgets mm -hmm. there. But I mean, this is fought at the city hall and the not even it's a, it's fought at like the HOA level in, mm -hmm. you know, you name it, like whatever small town it is, it's fought at the at the neighborhood uh, commissioner level. And so it's just very, very hard to mobilize all these different interests from the home builders to the mortgage companies to the portals. To it's, but do you think that that might be something where, say, even at the local level, like realtor associates are incredibly powerful? Yeah. Right. Number one. Number two. Uh, specifically like Zillow and CoStar own and operate the largest up rental portals in the world. Yeah. Right? And I know both companies have a significant amount of sort of consumer education type stuff. From what I could tell, neither have ever wanted to like delve into the well, touchy area politics, but I wonder on yeah. this one. We, we did, at Zillow, we, we did jump into homelessness. I mean, we, we created a program. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, we agreed to give $5 million away over five years uh, mm -hmm. to different, to different uh, causes. And the first one we focused on was homelessness. And um, so we did wade into it, but um, I'm not sure if that initiative is still, you know, is still yeah. active at Zillow or not, but um, you're, you're, you're absolutely right that in general, the, I mean, there's a collective action problem, I guess, is the second issue, right? right? It's fragmented, but all all causes suffer from some version of a collective action problem, which is like, oh, let somebody else do it. You know, you've got more resources or more vested, you know, oh, let the home builders do it. Oh, let the mortgage companies do it. Oh, let NAR do it. Right. And and so then kind of nobody really does it. Um, but um, California took a big step forward. I mean, they yep. we changed, I forget the name of the, of the, of the regulation, but they changed it. So now um, single family lots can have multiple dwellings built on them statewide. It was super yeah, kind of used. Yeah. yeah, I know my neighborhood here in, in West L.A. is freaking out about it because they're, you know, people are worried that um, developers are going to buy a lot and build like six townhouses where there used to be one home. Mm -hmm. And um, and that, you know, might that change the, the character of the neighborhood? And um, yeah, it probably will. But you know what? That's. If you want to tackle housing affordability, that's what we need. We need six houses where there was you know, where there was one home. So um, it's uh, it's a thorny issue. Well, yeah, let me yeah. let me go let ahead. me pivot a little bit too. Let's let's go a little lighter than like <laughs> From the crappy venture capital market to homelessness to where are we going? Oh, yeah, I mean, my blog vendor alleys. They always call the TMZ of real estate. So I was I was into the, <laughs> the gossipy things or whatever. Right. But you know, one thing that I think Rob and I and a lot of people in the industry really can't still understand i mean i don't know if the word is understand but it's it's the as we call them the zaders out there right of how still people are still hating on um zillow and what is i mean most professional people in the mls or brokerage business i think you know realize what you what what zillow has done and everything else but i mean you were in the thick of that you know and the the whole we're never going to become a broker messaging and how that turned around i mean what do you think is there what is the root there here is it just posturing or wh where do you think that why does that still hang around here um i think when there's a lot of money at stake people people's guards are up um and they tend to have a a, a posture of of skepticism and cynicism and that's understandable um i think that uh uh, you know, Zillow's made plenty of mistakes over the years, including when I was running it, that um, gave haters material to work with. <laughs> um, and so that uh, that probably contributes to it. Um, and then, uh, you know, I don't know. This is also an industry that I've never seen anything like this industry is pretty different than other industries. I mean, I now invest in a lot of startups in a lot of spaces. And for those that are just live and breathe real estate, there are a couple distinguishing characteristics. One is 
generally people are, are much more hospitable and social and friendly because the people that choose to go into real estate, like they love people, they, they're salesy, they, they love getting to know people. They're, they're also very entrepreneurial because um, they're small business owners. I mean, that's what a real estate agent is. They're an individual business owner. That's very different from most other industries. Um, but um, they're also, um, uh, you know, they also are um, like the work is lumpy in real estate. So when you're busy, you're busy. When you're not, you are on a lot of Facebook groups. You're in a lot of blogs. Yeah. You're on Twitter a lot. And because these people aren't typically working at companies earning salaries, there's just a lot of time available for That's interesting, yeah. You know, and you don't get time for fetching in some other industries where people work at companies and there are deliverables required. And um, we go to a lot of conferences in this industry and we network a lot. We listen to a lot of podcasts like this. And so anyway, so that that creates an environment that is uh, is ripe for a boogeyman. Um, and, uh, you know, Zillow has delivered on that, uh, you know, pretty reliably. Yeah. One other thing is, um, you know, we've talked on another podcast about Picasso. Um, so if, if I remember correctly, isn't that the fastest company to become a unicorn yes yes what? i mean i'd love to be in the room with you and austin and the guys when that was announced what what was can you can i'm mean, just again like being a fly in the wall what was that moment like was it was it was it on chat was it were you guys you, <laughs> no. how does yeah, that kind of talk you through that so i mean we raised our series a um from uh mavron and crosscut and um and global founders capital at a, a pretty a pretty healthy valuation, you know, under $100 million, but a, but a pretty big valuation for a Series A. We then raised the Series B from, if I remember correctly, Graycroft, Fifth Wall, and, and a couple other investors. And um, uh, and that was at a, a, you know, the, the unicorn type valuation. And when we were getting ready to announce that round, um, we didn't really know that was that we were the fastest to be a unicorn. I think it was like six months or something like that from inception to, to that round. But then we did some research and we're like, yeah, I, th I think maybe. And we spent a lot of time trying to validate it. And then we had this big discussion of should we announce it? Is it obnoxious? It's kind of tacky and and chest thumping. Um, and, um, you know, and it's, it's like, what does it even mean anyway, et cetera. And so ultimately we decided to announce it because we thought it would be uh, good for brand building and recruiting and 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 it was. But I mean, I, to be perfectly honest, I'm still a little uncomfortable with that designation because it, mm. it does feel very boast. It, it's a little bit more boastful than Austin or I really are in real life, but it was important to sort of put the company on the map. So that's right. how I feel about it. Um, so it was, now, it was, I mean, it was, then it was we went on to raise a Series C at a, at a quite a bit higher valuation. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the company's now in 40 markets in four countries. And we're, you know, we've been around for about two years. We are way ahead of where Zillow was after two years in terms of any metric you want to look at, brand awareness, uh, traffic, um, headcount, capital raised, revenue. We just passed a billion dollars of revenue. Um, so, you know, Picasso is off to a very fast start. And frankly, I think the idea, I mean, I'm, I, I'm so proud of what the team built at Zillow, but I, I will say this, I think the what we're doing at, at Picasso is more exciting in a lot of ways. I mean, Zillow provided information transparency, which was which is great, and information is power. And the fact that people can now get all this great real estate data at their fingertips and on their cell phone, that's awesome. I'm so proud of that, and that's terrific. But once you have all that access to information, then you know, then what? Like Zillow is still 15 years later trying to you know, trying to take it to the next step. Okay, we'll help you sell your home, buy your home, connect with an agent, et cetera, buy it, get a mortgage. Like all that is still in process. And what Picasso is trying to do is, is give people a totally different experience in their life, help democratize access to second home ownership. I have been lucky enough because I am, have the resources. I've been lucky enough to own a second home. It's awesome. <laughs> you know, when I'm at my second home, um, my kids are happy. I'm happy. My wife is happy. Our extended family is happy. Like there's just something we breathe the air differently. You, you just like this, the burden of life is, is alleviated when you're at a second house. 
And it's hard to explain to, you know, just how life changing that can be if you haven't had that experience. And we are trying at Picasso to make that experience available to tens of millions of people around the world who could not otherwise afford to own a second home were it not for co-ownership. So it's a pretty kick-ass, exciting mission that uh, to me is even more energizing than information transparency, which Zillow accomplished in, in spades. So, yeah. you know, so disclosure time, because you know, since, since I'm on the Picasso Board of Advice, I have to be a little bit careful. But what you just said, man, just like naturally leads to, is there a next step? I mean, do you think you guys would go past just second home ownership and think about bringing this to sort of a wider well, primary Well, so I mean, co-ownership co doesn't, doesn't really work on primary home ownership because you can't be there at the same time <laughs> as the other person. But, you know, interestingly, we do have a lot of customers and we didn't anticipate this, a lot of customers whose only home they own is a Picasso. So for example, imagine, um, you know, we've got a bunch of these people who- So they're they moving live, like eight times a year? Is that what they're doing? Like, Well, no, no, not really. It's, they live in San Francisco or New York and or LA and they rent and because they can't afford to buy. So they rent an apartment in Los Angeles, an apartment in New York, apartments, that's where they live. But they want to own real estate, but they can't afford to own a place in New York or San Francisco, at least a place of the quality that they want. But they do have three hundred thousand or four hundred thousand dollars available to to buy real estate. But three hundred thousand isn't going to get you much of anything in San Francisco. And so what they do is they buy a Picasso in Palm Springs. They buy a Picasso in Tahoe. They buy a Picasso in Napa Valley for four hundred thousand dollars, which is one eighth of a $3 million house or one eighth of a $5 million house. And so the only real estate they own is their Picasso, which is one eighth of a home because they rent their primary home. Interesting. I mean, the thing that I was wondering about was because, you know, it just occurred to me, I think uh, Andrew uh, Flackner and his wife, I think they actually have a co-ownership situation for a primary residence. Really? And they're I do wonder, like, so they both live together. Correct. So it's like you, you in other oh, words, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. pulling money together, you could go in and buy like a five bedroom house. It's much nicer in a better location. And then as long as, you know, yeah, as long as you're like are, really like each other, I think it'll there work. There are startups right? doing, there are startups doing that. And um, I mean, Divi started doing that for multi-generational uh, family. Mm -hmm. that, that was kind of Divi's original business model was yeah. to help, you know, help parents and their kids buy a house together uh, mm -hmm. or, help, you know, um, you know, I have a friend who lives in Washington, D.C. with his girlfriend of 10 years, and they just bought a townhouse together. It's actually really hard to do that. It's pretty complicated. Yes. And what happens if, you know, if you break up and, you know, yep. et cetera. So, like, yep. so, so there are startups trying to do that. I think that's a much smaller opportunity than what we're doing at Picasso. Um, mm -hmm. Most people, when they reach a certain income level, they aspire to second home ownership. And very, very few of them are able to actually own a second home. So I think our addressable market is very large at Picasso, and it's also global, which is why mm -hmm. we've already launched in the UK, Spain, and Mexico. Right on. Yeah, no, I mean, co-ownership and, you know, all that is, like, it's real hot topic. So um, the time we have left, I guess I'm now curious, like, what, what do you look forward to? Like, what are you seeing that you're kind of, you know what? that trend that especially as a venture capitalist you understand housing you understand tech like what excites you you know these days uh, well the, this the topic that we've been talking about is is exciting to me it, it's it's around democratizing real estate as an asset class again not from an informational standpoint but as an asset class so it's a huge part of our economy it's like 18 percent of gdp or something like that and yet the ticket price is so big that most people can't get in whether it's to own rental properties or to own a second home or to own a primary home so it, or to own a, a commercial, you know, office space or a, you know, mm -hmm. a, a, a multifamily project. So, I think democratization of the asset class through fractionalization is a really exciting trend, and there are dozens of startups trying yeah. to yeah. Approach, a, attack it from different angles, and, yeah. and that's very exciting to me. All right, um, yeah, it's exciting, man. Yeah, two things. What do you think is you know, where do you think the there's a lot of uh, lawsuits out there right and a lot of that is threatening the um yeah you know bu buyers right as far as buyers having to pay their own commission okay yeah and that really goes into some of the business models of zillow and others yeah. what do you think the way forward i mean i you know these guys aren't you know you you know for sure this but you know these guys are not stupid there's probably gaming war gaming this thing right now but where do you think you know i guess a two-parter like where do you think they go and then Another thing is, you know, with this recent kind of like pullback from iBuying, which was based upon 
they couldn't really predict the price of houses. I mean, you know, within a within a time frame. Do you think consumers have like picked up on that, and and the 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 main value proposition of this estimate is kind of in 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 jeopardy there? And and do those things kind of connect in a way? So let's see. Let me. I'll start with the the estimate question first, and then go to the regulatory environment. So, um, you know, the the estimate and knowing what your house is worth, I think, is still really important. Now, it's less exciting to check your estimate when it's going down. Right. So I think um, you know there'll be less voyeuristic traffic over the next couple of years. Yeah, that's um, that's very that's very insightful. That's true, point. right? For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, it, you know, you, you tend to stop checking the stock market, and you tend to stop checking your estimate a little bit. But um, but but the, but for somebody in the transaction, somebody that you know, buyer or seller, I think it's 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 becoming super important. I mean, I bought a home. I remember I bought a home a couple of years ago and I bid, you know, X for the house and then they responded with Y and I, I increased my bid and then they responded with a really weird number. It was like, you know, six, eight, two, four, three, one, five or whatever. And I was like, that's a weird number to counter out. And I asked my real estate agent what that was. And he's like, that's the estimate, you dummy. Um, <laughs> they, you know, they countered at this estimate. And I was like, oh, <laughs> Damn it. Oh, oh. <laughs> Boom, so, baby. And that was years ago. It was like five years ago or more, maybe seven years ago. So I think <laughs> I think it is it's pretty darn important in the transaction. It's become much more accurate, just to give you a sense. When we launched 15 years ago, yeah. the estimate had a 14% margin of error, and today it has about a two percent margin of error. So no, when you, when you guys bifurcated that from you know listing price and everything, that really made a big difference. Yeah. Now the regulatory thing is is super interesting, and frankly, I think you know probably the industry is not talking enough about it. There are two lawsuits, one of which has class action status, one of which probably will get class action status, and there's one DOJ investigation. And all three of these things are looking at the issue of cooperative compensation, and all three of them uh, allege that uh, it is price fixing for a listing agent to share their commission with a buyer's agent. And uh, I'm not an antitrust lawyer. I'm not a, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on this topic, but I'm probably more well-informed than most. I think there's a decent chance that cooperative compensation goes away in the United States, which would have a seismic impact on the industry. It would change uh, really everything. So, so let's start with real estate agents for a moment. First of all, when a buyer's agent gets a buyer lead, if they have to convince the buyer to pay them directly, a lot of buyers are gonna say no thanks. And yeah. so there'll be many fewer buyer agents out there. We may lose a couple hundred thousand real estate agents. Uh, that obviously has huge implications for the brokerages and then for the franchisors. Uh, then it has implications for NAR, whose membership would be uh, significantly lessened as implications for the MLSs and the, and the realtor associations. And then for the portals, the lead gen companies that sell leads to real estate agents, well, what the value of a buyer lead is a lot lower if that buyer's agent now has to convince the buyer to pay him a commission. So the value, the cost per lead, the value of the leads are lower and that's bad for those that sell leads. And then all the other tech vendors that sell stuff to real estate agents, whether it's websites or, or you know, mortgage businesses or CRMs or you name it, like that, that, that would be challenging yeah. for all of them. So, so I worry about this, um, and I think the industry probably isn't worrying about it enough. Um, and um, you know, it's going to be really interesting to watch. Uh, there, there will be companies that do just fine if that should happen, but there'll be other companies that don't. And um, you know, I'll leave it to guys like you to with podcasts like this to speculate who the winners and losers will be. But um, you know, we all should be watching it more closely than I think we are. Yeah, and and maybe. And and this this is a great segue too. Maybe we can wrap up with this. But you know, you've you've had a storied career, you know, Hotwire, Zillow. I mean, just whatever. But I know there's a lot of vendors out there, a lot of companies, a lot of brokerages. Times are tough right now. Things are changing so fast. But you've had that kind of experience. I, I remember reading a story about what happened at Hotwire and during the nine nine eleven. Yeah. Right? And how that just, it, it, how can you run a travel site when you can't fly anymore or people are afraid to fly? What can you give our listeners, those, those vendors out there, those, those company owners, those entrepreneurs out there that's happening right now from your experience? I know, I mean, yeah. I've been there before, but you definitely have well, been there. What, what can you, what kind of advice can you give everybody here? So I've, I've written a couple blog posts on this topic that are at dot LA. So dot period LA is the news site that I founded that covers LA tech. 
and actually just this week I posted a, a, an article that, that discusses this. But in short, um, number one, cut to survive. So you got to cut unnecessary expenses to extend your runway. Number two, you have to prioritize ruthlessly. Number three, there may be pivots in your business that are required. So for example, Hotwire, we pivoted the whole company towards hotels because people weren't flying after 9-11. So we mm -hmm. focused more on selling hotels. Um, uh, so there may be business model tweaks or, or product marketing pitches, product marketing changes. You know, Picasso, for example, is responding to this changing environment with higher mortgage rates and, and people entering a, a recession by focusing on different types of inventory in different types of cities. So make adjustments in order to adapt to the, the current reality. Uh, number four, try to reconnect your employees to the mission. So employee retention and employee engagement is more important than ever. And um, you got to remind people why they joined your company in the first place so that they stay committed and engaged. Uh, number five, you got to reconnect or not reconnect. you got to manage your board and communicate with your board because they could be your best ally if you need not just mentorship, but potentially capital. In the case of Hotwire, for example, we did a, a down inside round after 9-11, which saved the company. In the case of Zillow, after the GFC, the counsel that we got from our board of directors, from the experience they had, was invaluable. Um, so those are just some things that you got to do to manage through these, these downturns. And then I guess finally, there are so many more resources out there, um, you know, like this podcast, you know, my office hours podcast, I just mm -hmm. recorded an episode with Greg Schwartz from Tomo, who used to be at Zillow with me, where we talk about this for almost an hour, Greg, yeah, <laughs> this, exact, right. this exact discussion. And my question to Greg Schwartz at Tomo is, what are you doing to manage through this? Yeah. So mm -hmm. you can learn from people like Greg or others, Greg Schwartz or others, and, and you guys, uh, as, as we're all managing through this together. So it's a, it's a great benefit of social media. I wish yeah, in in prior recessions, all this this wealth of, of knowledge had been more readily accessible. It's mm -hmm. it's actually a, a, you know just just quick thought. The way startup founders adjusted to this venture chill that started just a couple months ago was very different than prior times. I feel like everybody adapted quickly. Companies mm -hmm. did their layoffs quickly. Um, you know, companies raised money quickly. Like people batten down the hatches within a couple of weeks or months. Why? Because VCs were out there with their tweet storms, with their PowerPoint decks, with their YouTube videos, with their podcasts, all talking about all this stuff. Past cycles, it took six or 12 months for founders to adapt because it just took a lot longer for that information to be disseminated and for that, um, for, for people to react. Fantastic, man. That, that's this is amazing. So yeah. You on that. Good talking to you guys. Thank yeah, you hopefully that. we could have you back on, you know, as uh, the market continues to change <laughs> and maybe Picasso makes a huge announcement like, hey, we got to get Spencer back on to talk about. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know where to find me. Doing. Yeah, thanks, really Bob. appreciate thanks, your Greg. time. And uh, thank you, Spencer. And thanks, thanks to everybody Spencer. for tuning in. Uh, I hope this was, uh, it was incredible because I, for me, that's, uh, I didn't, I didn't, never knew about kind of the things that he had to do, you know, Hotwire and elsewhere to kind of make sure they survive some of these events. Oh yeah, so, huge, huge, yeah, yeah, great story. I think it was on Bloomberg or something. If you, if you Google it, yeah. Um, but if you, if, if you have a chance, I would read that story. Yeah, and uh, you know, I almost forgot to ask him, but I got to run. You know, uh, hey man, you know that uh, thing we we're talking about? Who's the next Gary Keller? Yeah, <laughs> you know, hey, I think we might have spoken to a guy whose name should at least be kind of in the running, right? You never know. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's got like ninety companies. He's the best. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, Greg. I got to run. So, All right. Thanks, everybody. Ciao, y'all.